Welcome, everybody, to Mind in America. We've had a lovely summer break. I don't know about you, but I managed to get to some wonderful places across the country, and my last trip was in Wyoming. I've just been home a few days, and it was bittersweet coming home. So it's a wonderful place to be. This is our first broadcast back, and we have our first guest, who I'm very excited to welcome, Ms. Julie Lucas. Hello, Julie. Hello, Janet. Thank you for inviting me. Well, we've we've had some wonderful conversations, and I've been looking forward to recording one and giving other people the chance to hear some of uh, your amazing story. Um, you are in Minnesota at present. I am. It's a balmy fifty degrees today. Beautiful right. fall day. All right. And how you've lived there for quite some time? Oh uh, yeah, my entire life. I have never left my area code. Which, thankfully, it's a big area code, but I have been in northern Minnesota my entire life. Wonderful. And you presently are the executive director of Mining Minnesota? Yep, you are correct. So we are the trade association for non-ferrous mining. Minnesota is really well known for its iron mining, and they have their own trade association. And then I represent the copper nickel projects in our state. Excellent. Excellent. So um, a little background on you. How did you end up in this job and, and your background in the industry? Because I, you, as you and I have talked about, um, we have a shortage of women in the industry. So I, I love to hear your story. <laughs> I would love to tell you it was a linear path that made sense. I would love to tell you that I grew up wanting to go into mining and that it was always going to be my path, but that would be lying to you. And I definitely never thought I'd be in this role even a year and a half ago. So in this role, I do public relations and government affairs, and that is nowhere in my background. I'm My training is as a water resource scientist. That's my master's degree. And my bachelor's was biochemistry. And I, and I chose that bachelor's degree specifically because I wanted to study how environmental pollutants affect human health. So that was my initial goal going, going into college. I am very much the generation of grew up with the battles um, against acid rain and saving the rainforest and all of that. And that was very much my focus going into college. And I got my master's, like I said, in water resources science. And then I moved to the Iron Range. So the Iron Range is this mining district in northern Minnesota. We've been mining for 140 years and I knew nothing about mining. So I moved up here. And I went, I went swimming in a lake that was called Lake Orbegon. And I didn't realize that it was or dash B dash gone. It was an old mining pit. <laughs> I thought Orbegon was a name. I just thought it was, I just yeah. thought it was a name. I was like, Orbegon, sure. And so I knew nothing about mining. And I was actually very passionately against mining because it, I thought it went against everything I had gone to school for. I looked at it as big holes in the ground, big stockpiles. And what happened was that in my first job after teaching up here, I went to work for an environmental consulting firm and their primary clients are mining clients still to this day. And so I started working on these projects as a water resource scientist. And I realized what my perceptions of mining were was not, they were not lining up with what the reality of mining was. I wasn't seeing environmental destruction. I was seeing an operation that had operated and brought ore up so that we could make steel with it. And it wasn't an overnight transition. It took time for me to kind of come around, uh, but eventually I did. And I got lucky enough to get to go work at an iron ore operation in the environmental department for over 13 years. So mm -hmm. that was that was pretty awesome. And it was funny because I realized at that job that I was doing all the things that little me wanted to do. I was making a positive impact on the environment. I was making industry cleaner and and healthier for people. But I was doing it from within the industry. Yeah. And so I, I worked at the iron ore mine for a long time and then as, as we've previously discussed in 2020, I went through breast cancer and <laughs> during the pandemic, which was terrible timing, I do not recommend it, zero out of five stars. 
And I went through that and I realized life is really short and change is good. And an opening came up at Twin Metals, Minnesota, which is a proposed copper nickel mine up in Ely. And it was for, you know, like I said, director of water resources. And I thought, this is, this is it. This is for me. This is my, it's, it's my education. It's my career. And it's only an hour from home. And so it's, it's my home that I want to protect. So I went there for a year and unfortunately the, we lost our leases, our federal leases. Folks might on the, that are listening to this podcast might be familiar with the twin metals project and, and the challenges up there. And so I found myself in my mid forties trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And this position was open and I thought, I don't do government affairs. I don't do public relations. And the few of the folks from the board of directors said, good. We, we want somebody who, who hasn't, we want a, you know, a new face to this, a new voice. Um, so that was my really, really long way of saying how I got into this role, which is completely different than anything I've ever done. And it's, and it's amazing. I love, I love advocating for the industry and for the people in the industry. Well, I, I think the industry has a wonderful advocate. So it's a win-win. I, I first I want to say um, about uh, going through breast cancer. Um, I, I, I I know it's it's tough. I, I, how are you now? I am good. So I am three years out. And so I have to hit five years before people start feeling comfortable. Um, but it is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month here in October. And always a good reminder to people that men and women have to do self-checks and get their screenings because had I not got my mammogram, to be blunt, I would not be here today. Well, so. and, and power to you for talking about it because so many uh, are afraid to to bring out uh, a difficult challenge like that. So, you know, it, it speaks volumes to the type of person you are that you um, can so uh, just matter of fact speak about and, 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 and some, something like that comes good stuff that you've made some life changes and find yourself here today. Um, I, um, I love the fact that you were questioning the industry and, and saw what was going on and made a change from inside. I, 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 I see a lot of um, opinions and attitudes that aren't based on knowledge of what really happens. And it's so important. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about being, and I hate to like narrow it down so specifically, but being a woman in a very male dominated industry and, yeah. and, and doing uh, so successfully. And, and you and I have talked about this, that we need more women in the industry. We have to tell our stories. We have to show that, you know, it, yeah, maybe it's not easy, but nothing is. But, you know, being a woman in a male-dominated industry, go. <laughs> <laughs> it, I love it, actually. I, I grew up on a small family farm and, you know, my dad didn't, there was no differentiation between my brother and I as to who had to do, you know, cleaning the barns. Anybody can pick up a pitchfork and start shoveling. So it's, uh, I grew up very much not ever thinking about gender. It was, you know, in farming, it's all hands on deck. You, <laughs> you got to get hay put up. So it doesn't matter. And I'll admit, I went through the vast majority of my life not thinking about it. When I went to college for biochemistry, about half of us uh, were women in that program. And I never really gave it thought. And then I got into this industry and, and it was even before this industry, just being in natural resources tends to, that was, that was a male dominated field when I just got into natural resources to start with. And you don't notice at first. And then you start going to meetings and you realize I'm the only <laughs> woman here. And and sometimes you don't even notice that till you go into a space where there are more women. And, you know, I've gone to conferences that had more women and there was a line at the bathroom. And I was like, oh, this is something I never deal with at work ever. <laughs> and I know that sounds silly, but it's the shortest line at work. <laughs> you just realize, like, oh, wait. 
Um, and I, I will never say it was without its challenges. And sometimes it's hard because I was young when I started in, the, you know, I was in my twenties and there were times where I had to step back and say, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting buck back from this person. Is it because I'm female? Is it because I'm young? Is it because they just don't like me? <laughs> Maybe they're just like this to everyone. And I always kind of had to separate that out because there were times where it was clear that it was age or gender or that they just didn't like me. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you have to tease that out. I got really lucky though, in that I had really amazing mentors and from both genders. I had male bosses who had my back and who, you know, they were, they were there for me. They, you know, they did everything that you would ask for in a mentor. But then I also got really lucky in that I found out early in my career about Women's Mining Coalition and that group of women, because on the Iron Range, we don't have a lot of women in the generation above me that are in management roles. And I found those mentors in that organization through Women's Mining Coalition. And so I had that benefit of people that have gone through what I went through. But, you know, we really do owe a lot to the women that came before us. But we also have a huge responsibility to the women that follow us to stand up and make things better. And But we also have an obligation to the men we work with to educate them, to just get them to see what some of our challenges are because they not, may not recognize it. And it's sometimes, yes, they do things that are just blatantly terrible. But I will say that as more women get into positions, it is it is easier because you do have just that power in numbers. Yeah. And sadly, our, our industry is just really lacking women still. I mean, it's it's embarrassing how low we are. And I think it's just a as we face a work, you know, a workforce shortage, we have yeah. to be asking those questions. Why aren't there more of us? And how do we get more of us? Because it's, we're half the population. If you have a workforce shortage, you need to be asking where's this other half of the population and how do we bring them in? Because yeah. we do bring different perspectives and different ways of operating. Oh, completely, completely. And, 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 and of great value to have those different perspectives. Yep. Um, I think, um, your point about mentorship is really important that um, I think that might be a way of getting more women interested because I think you're different. Um, and I know I'm different and you don't, I get the feeling from you that you don't really need to fit in. It, you're doing your own thing. <laughs> I'm a and, redhead. I, you know, when you're born with hair and you're 2% of the population, you give up on fitting in immediately. Just <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. Um, I think also, your background from a farm family makes a huge difference because one of the things that I think the industry and ranching uh, is subjected to is the wrong, um, the, the, there's a bias that it's a very patriarchal, um, male dominated, yes, yes it is. But, but when you go uh, and you may have done consultations, I have with, with ranch families for, for mining projects, you go to the family. You don't go to the the male head of the family. You go to the family, and the family listens to you. and the, And the women are strong, and they are deeply involved in their business of ranching. And I think that gives a leg up because you're not coming at it from somebody who's in a subordinate role in your family background. You're coming at it as a vital piece of the family business. And um, I think that often we kind of project ranching and, and mining in that same light. You know, it's the, it's the cowboy, it's the head oh, of the, yeah. family, the miner. No, there's these amazingly strong women and showcasing them and highlighting them and bringing them, bringing them out is so, it's so important to going forward. I think it makes mining much better look at look at the changes you've made i just think you know we talk about diversity and we forget there's just diversity of thought as well and just diversity of approach and just bringing in people that don't see things the same way you do i 
I feel really proud of the impact I made at the mining operation I worked at. And part of the reason I was able to make that impact is because for me, environmental regulation isn't about metrics. It's not about regulations and laws. It's about our obligation to the earth that we are tapping for these minerals. It's our obligation to our neighbors. And I, I feel like in my role, I was able to bring those regulations to life. They weren't just expectations being placed on our workforce. It wasn't just, we clean up spills because we're required to. No, we clean up spills because of, and then you, you know, you're able to explain why there's regulations. And it's just having that different approach and different way of looking at things. And even just a different way of looking at mining and how we, you know, how we approach, you know, the industry. We had um, the operation I was at, we had uh, a local tribal elder come and do a ceremony and asking for forgiveness for using the resources. And sh she really, it was, it was amazing because she said, it's okay that we mine. She's like, this isn't, this, this is not a judgment that mining is bad. She said, it's a recognition to value what we mine and to mm -hmm. value those minerals and those resources. And it's just thinking about what we do as an industry different can allow us to do it better. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 one of the things that bothers me is how much of our mineral wealth we've outsourced to other countries and they don't do it as well as we do it here. So the oh. argument that you're protecting the environment by getting it from somewhere else is, is, is wrong. And the other is that it's harming our communities. It's harming our, our youth that need those jobs. It's harming our national security. It's har harming domestic, uh, everything to taxation. When you farm out 27 critical metals are 100% sourced elsewhere from in the U S and I'd love to see that number disappear. I would love, you know, where it can, right? You know, we're always going to rely on, on other partners, but how do we not take accountability for what we need? How do we not first tap our own resources before asking someone else to, you know, and I, I, I hear that all the time, you know, mining can't be done well, so we can't do it here. And then they say, well, we're just going to get it from overseas. And I say, well, you just told me we can't do it well. So you're saying it's okay to ask somebody else to have that burden, but you're not willing to bear it yourself. And I, on an ethical level, I just really, really struggle with that because it just feels really irresponsible and selfish. And it just, it just feels wrong to me because we are the ones driving the demand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we, we, Put it out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, and we yeah. do that with a lot of stuff. We, we, we are huge consumers in this country. I mean, I'm looking at my desk here that's just filled with stuff, <laughs> just stuff. Yeah. And I don't know where this stuff came from. And you know, but as we, and sometimes I'm not going to get to choose where that stuff came from. There's just certain things that I'll have. But when it comes to actually planning out an energy transition and, and setting big goals for it and, and making a plan on how we're going to do it, we have the opportunity to talk supply chain and supply web and figure out how we're going to get that stuff before we start doing it. So we have this massive opportunity to do this ethically and to do it well, if we're willing to. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. it's getting people to the table to recognize mining. We're we're collaborators. We're a part of the solution. Please work with us instead of against us. Yeah, it's it's good for our community. It's good for our region. It's good for our country. It's good yeah. for our, it's it's our future. Now, and you're in a very mineral rich area. Yeah, this state is Minnesota blows my mind because I like I said I didn't grow up in a mining area. I grew up just south of Duluth which is on the tip of Lake Superior. We have sand and gravel mines. <laughs> That's it. And I move up here. And like I said, we've had iron ore mining since 1880. And we have another 100 years of it to go. It's, you know, massive iron ore deposits. Um, 
and that got us through World War II. That's something we're super proud of. But then we have this copper nickel deposit formed a billion years later. You know, iron was two billion years ago, copper nickel a billion years ago, give or take a few. And we, you know, some of our deposits are in the top 10 worldwide. They're, they're massive deposits. Minnesota, you have Michigan with nickel and you have Minnesota with nickel. You know, copper, yes, yeah, Southwest U.S. has an insane amount of copper, but we have copper too. And we have cobalt and platinum, palladium, gold. And it's, it's this massive, it's called the Duluth complex and then the Tamarack intrusion that were formed when Minnesota tried to split itself. Actually, North America tried to rip itself in half. Um, and so those deposits formed back then and they are massive, massive deposits of minerals that just so happen to line up with what's needed for clean energy. It's it's a great opportunity for our country to not just access some of the minerals needed, but also to be forced into a conversation about what that means. When we say we want clean energy, what are we asking for? Who's who's building it for us? And, and this push to see more development in your region means more investment in your region, which means more infrastructure, which means benefits to the whole community. Absolutely. These are great. You know, we, we talk about, oh, mining are great paying jobs. It's like, we love to talk about that, but I don't know that we always are able to communicate, you know, to people when we say good paying jobs, these are family sustaining jobs. Yeah. These are community sustaining jobs. These are jobs where you can afford not just a house, not just a vehicle, but everything else in life. Just and and when you spend that money, it's going back into your community. So you're sustaining a community through these jobs and you know the health care that comes along typically with these jobs and just the benefits and it, these aren't casual, you know, get by as best as you can jobs. These are real, like I can live a good life with these jobs. And yeah, we have the potential for, you know, we already, like I said, have 4,000 people employed by the mining industry up here now, but we have the potential to add on significantly to that number. Yeah. The, the, the other thing about these jobs is, and, and I'm a big supporter of, you know, however you want to live your life, but they can be one paycheck families. They yep. are good enough. It doesn't have to be that you're doing two jobs with both parents. These 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 pay well, and you can support a family on yeah. them. And Absolutely. then your choices become abundant. Yeah, yeah. I I um I have this this saying that I I made up. Um, uh, I kind of stole part of it from somebody, but full scale mineral dominance is my goal. And I know we can't get there right away, but we were self-reliant on, on many things that we aren't anymore. Um, but I think, I think things are going to change. And I yep. think industry groups like you work for and people like you are very important to the future. So I, I, I greatly appreciated hearing your story. Well, I just, we have that potential to be self-reliant and we also have the potential to partner with folks we haven't partnered with before to improve our recycling of electronics and our recycling of these materials. Because if anyone knows the value of minerals, it's those of us who dug them up out of the ground. You know, we're the ones that have seen folks coming off of night shift. We're the folks who maybe have done night shift ourselves. I get really loopy around three in the morning. <laughs> um, but, you know, we know what it's taken to explore that deposit, develop that deposit, mine, you know, do the mineral, actually mine that deposit, reclaim that area. You know, we're the ones that really know that value of that material. Yeah. And, you know, one of our close best ways of getting to that, like you said, that self-reliance is to make sure we're also making sure those minerals keep staying in circulation because yeah. the demand's not going to go away. We're not going to, we're never going to, you know, recycle ourselves out of jobs. There's so much demand for these minerals. That's the only way we're going to keep moving forward is to keep those minerals in circulation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get um, frustrated. Uh, two things frustrate me when I go through rural communities and I see them dying yep. and I know what wealth is sitting in the ground that can <laughs> be managed properly. The yep. other thing, frustrates me is when I see 
um, when there's a lack of understanding on how many of the towns started. So if you're yeah. traveling the, the West, chances are the town that's a beautiful tourist attraction was a silver mine one day. Yes, yes. We talk <laughs> about that here all the time. Yeah, it's it's, and, and they're not hiding it. Like if you read about it, you, you yeah. can find out that people just don't understand the history. And I think education goes a long way. It does. And they don't, they don't understand the history or just the scale of one of my friends have put it really well. He said a lot of tourism towns and he was talking about towns out West and, and some of ours tourism is piggybacked on the infrastructure built by mining. Yep. And, and I really like that, that way of, cause I love tourism. I love being a tourist. Okay. I love, I love going out West. I love going, I love going anywhere. I am, I crave variety and I love seeing other places. So I have nothing against tourism. Tourism, I live in a tourist area. We have state park with a campground. I know we have amenities here because of tourists. I know that helps, but we also have, I'm, I'm a township supervisor for the same community. So I know that infrastructure we have is coming from our taxes, our tax dollars, our property taxes. So it's, you know, and I know this area that I'm in was a was a former logging area. Minnesota also once upon a time we had the most white pines in the world. Um, mm. We love industry in our state, so this was a logging area. So the roads and and the you know a lot of things we have here are from the logging industry. So it's you know trying to recognize and get people to see that yeah. you know the city of Ely next to the Boundary Waters only exists because of mining. Yes, tourism plays a huge part in it now, but I think it's important to recognize mining, what it happened. Mining has the capital to put yes. in the infrastructure that tourism can't because it doesn't yes. have the capital, but it can benefit from it. And a, a, when I see a lot of these towns, they're beautiful tourist towns, but you know, mining mining stopped. Maybe the resource was you know finished. Maybe they they moved on, but they left the infrastructure and boom, secondary industry just magically can happen. Well, especially, I mean, we have a really beautiful mountain bike park um, just 20 miles south of me. It's an old mine pit. <laughs> and it's funny because you'll, you'll run into people in the parking lot and they're like, this place is amazing. I don't, I just didn't know Minnesota had stuff like this. And I'm like, you, you do know it's an old mining operation, right? And they're, what? <laughs> and it just, they don't, it's just so hard to wrap their head. They just think we have this super cool, um, it's called the Redhead Mountain Bike Park. I just want to point out with my red hair. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, we wouldn't have that mountain bike park. Just like we also have in the Cuyuna Iron Range, just south of, you know, further south of here. Um, they have the Cuyuna Mountain Bike Park. Same thing. It's stockpiles <laughs> and mine pits from the old iron ore operations. So even some of the recreation that we rely on for tourism only exists thanks to the way we shape the land. Actually, back then it was unintentional, but it turned out fantastic. Um, but it also means that there's a potential for new operations to think about that end use and mm -hmm. actually de design it with tourism in its, you know, yeah. in mind. Yeah, yeah, the closure plan can can have different elements to it, right? Yeah, there's tons of opportunities. We move, we, we're really good at moving earth. You want, you want someone to move earth? Turn off. <laughs> we can do it. We do it well. Hey, Julie, it's been wonderful, wonderful talking yes, to thank you. you. The industry needs more people like you. And um, I want you to give a plug for your association and give us a link for people yeah. to get more information and also more information for the uh, Mining Coalition for Women. Yes. So we are Mining Minnesota, www.miningminnesota.com. You can click on there to learn more about our organization as well as our member companies. So New Range Copper Nickel, Twin Metals Minnesota, Talon Metals, and Encampment Minerals. And I definitely encourage you to you know, keep in touch with us because we will have stuff going on that is really exciting in this state. Um, and Women's Mining Coalition, I'm going to unfortunately probably blank on the website right now. So I will just tell you to Google Women's Mining Google. Coalition and get involved. So we have an annual fly-in to DC where every every year for one day, you know, a couple of days, one week, we get to actually get out there and advocate for our industry and 
the most powerful voices are the voices that are rarely heard. So folks that are actually in the field doing the jobs, this is your opportunity to go to DC and talk to people about what your life is like as a woman in mining and why mining is so important. So definitely recommend uh, folks check out that. And then there's always women in mining. There's also that organization and they have different chapters throughout the US or if you're like me in a misfit state, you just belong to the at large organization. Someday I'll get one of those going in our state. So yeah, well, there's, thank you. I have to admit, um, I have not been part of the mining, uh, women's mining coalition. So I'm gonna go and Google it. And yeah. I would love to uh, be able to connect with you in Washington. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much for reaching out to me and having me on this to talk about my little corner of the world. Well, it's been wonderful. And I wanna talk again, cause I want next time, I wanna hear more about what kind of work's going on in the area. Yeah. And uh, now that we know you, uh, let's let you tell us what's going on there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julie. And thanks, everybody. We will see you again next time. And uh, as always, um, full-scale mineral dominance. Let's go. Mining in the USA. Take care.